especially like to welcome any visitors we have and let you know that you are honored guests. And immediately after service, we'll have a lunch downstairs for our graduates. I think we have two. And so if you would, stay around for that. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome our Facebook watchers as well as the radio station. And would like to welcome you in any opportunity you have instead of radio and Facebook to come be with us and be a part of our worship time. Uh, in the way of some prayer requests, uh, Doug tells me his daughter-in-law will be graduating from North Carolina State and is looking at, is doing some job interviews and has already turned down one or two. So that's a blessing for that whole family as Miss Flo's been gone and Doug most of the summer doing babysitting. So that's a blessing that uh, she's out of school and, and has, is looking for a job. So remember that whole family, if you will. Uh, also, Miss Becky's home not feeling well and it's not a girl. <laughs> So just it, but the main thing is it be healthy. That's, that's the main prayer we have for that Becky would feel better and the baby would be a healthy baby. On September 9th, 2023, Bible Bowl in uh, it's Crookville, Tennessee. If anyone's interested in this, I will put it on the board if anyone would like to go attend this. It's, it's, it's September the 9th. And we have a card from uh, Miss Karen. Adrian's mother, uh, Karen Hamrick, says, Dear church family, I want to thank you for the blessed cards that you have sent me. Also, thank you for all your prayers. I am on the mend and feeling much better. Thank you again for your kindness. God bless Karen Hamrick. So I'll put that on the board as well here in a few minutes. Uh, like I said, we'll be having lunch afterwards. If you can, please stay around. As we have a couple of graduates, one from college and one from high school, so let's be a part of that. And with that, would you bow with me, please? Our God and our Father, we come to you to thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Father, for the time we have that we can come together as a family of Christians. And, Father, we pray that what we do and say here this day would be in accord to you, the will you would have us to do. And Father, we lift our prayer list to you. We pray for Becky and her baby. Pray for Si and the whole family as they go through the pregnancy that everything would be well and according to thy will. And Father, we pray for Doug and his family and his daughter-in-law as she's finishing college and pray that she might find a job locally, that they could stay local and just pray you'd be with them. And Father, we pray for our military, our firemen, our policemen, our EMS, the people that go out every day to protect us, that we have freedoms, that we can come and go as we please just, just because... People we may never meet take the opportunity to go out and be a service to the community, and we pray for their safety, that they would return home to their loved ones. And Father, we pray now as we go through the remainder of our time together here this day that you be with us and everything that's said and done. In Christ's name, amen. If you would turn with me to number 40. We're four zero. <clears throat> we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house.
If you would, please uh, mark number 206. And number 206 will be our song after the lesson. And before our lesson, we'll sing number 344. Number 344. chapter 14, verses 23 through 26, uh, Mark's version of the institution of the Lord's Supper uh, from the New King James Version. Verse 22, uh, the Bible says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. I assuredly say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. If you will, please pray for me, for, uh, pray with me for the bread. Right. Dear God, uh, we're thankful for that great sacrifice you made of your son on the cross. And Lord, as we uh, partake of the bread that represents your son's body, I pray this morning that we clear our minds and we focus on the uh, sacrifice that was made for all of us. Uh, and Lord, I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a prayer now for the cup. All right, dear God, as we uh, continue and we uh, drink of the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' blood, Lord, again, we're thankful for, uh, for the sacrifice that you made and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, we have, uh, now have a chance to give back, uh, and that's what, exactly what we're doing. We're giving back a portion of that which God has blessed us. Uh, without God, we'd have nothing. Uh, so if you will, there's a box in the back if you choose to give, and let's go to God in prayer. <clears throat> all right, dear Lord, thank you for all, all the blessings you've given us, and Lord, we know that uh, without you, we'd have nothing, and at, at this time... We're not just giving, we're giving back that because uh, you've already given this to us. But we're giving back to you a portion that uh, 
that you've blessed us with. And Lord, our prayer this morning is that uh, we use these funds to uh, further your kingdom, further your word. Uh, and Lord, I pray that the uh, men do everything according to your will with the funds. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning will be Romans 1, 18 through 23. Romans 1, 18 through 23. Romans 1, 18 through 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the corruptible God, un okay, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds four-footed beast, and creeping things. Good morning. Good to uh, see you this morning. We have several... Uh, visiting with us today. I want to again uh, welcome you to be with us this morning. Um, we have sound this week, I think online. Uh, we didn't have that last week or Wednesday, but I think we've corrected that. Um, technology is one of those things. Uh, it's good if it works. If it doesn't work, then it's not really worth a whole lot. But uh, but we're good. It's good to be together this morning. I want to begin by saying thank you to uh, to Vance and the others who who filled in last week. Uh, I wish I could have heard it, uh, but I uh, I know he did an excellent job. And and so this week I want to um, go back and in, into a text that we we were looking at a couple weeks ago uh, back on Mother's Day. In Acts chapter 17, I want to uh, try to pull a little bit more from this passage. If you will, if you'll go to Acts chapter 17, and we're going to begin at verse 26. As a way of reminder of what's going on is that Paul is at in Athens at the Areopagus, and he is... Um, He's speaking on the unknown God. He, he's revealing to these very idolatrous people, uh, very self-centered, humanistic kind of thinking. He, he's trying to reveal to them the true God. And so he says in verse 26, he, um, he points out a, a basic principle of existence is that all men uh, are made from one blood. He says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. So in other words, God put us here. God knows us also very well. And, and it's God who, 
uh, who established creation. He is the one that set it in motion. Now, man's efforts to reach out for God have been uh, varied in many different ways. Uh, man has, some have truly sought out God, and the scriptures record those for us, many of them. Others have sought God in, in other places. He says, um, and he'll go on to talk about how, how they, uh, some built idols in order to try to reach God. Uh, some have created their own doctrinal creeds and traditions in order to search out and to seek after God. But I want you to notice what he says in verse 27. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. It's like the idea that, that there's something in us as human beings, that, that innate desire for, uh, for meaning, uh, for explanation. There's something in us that, that naturally wants to seek out uh, for an answer to the God question. Uh, even those who are atheistic seek out, seek out for answers through their atheistic religion, their beliefs that uh, they, they try to replace God with some kind of man-made ideology or theory. Well, in doing that, they're just simply re trying to replace God with a theory of man, but they fall short. And he, he kind of compares it to those who, who are just kind of grasping out. You go to, um, you know, a party where, where they have a piñata and you see those uh, young people usually uh, trying to seek out the piñata to burst it open, right? And that's kind of the way it is when man seeks after God in his own way. He's, he's grasping at the air, but then he says this at the end of verse 27. And it's an important reminder for us. Yet he, God, is actually not far from each of us. It's not as though God has not made himself knowable, in other words. God ha has, has given us evidence. He's given us a, a direction, a path to him. And we're going to explore that just a little bit today, but... But the idea that, that God is some far-off, hard-to-find uh, being is simply not true. Um, we, we traveled last weekend to uh, the Mount Airy area, and we were staying in a house in Virginia. And we were, I felt like at home, it's like where I grew up, in the backwoods of America, right? out in the country, and I remember at one point we're on a two-lane road with one lane. You ever been on those? And, um, you know, if you're not familiar with that, if you've never experienced the one-lane, two-lane idea, when another car comes the other direction, it gets a little anxious. Now, I, I'm, I've been there. I've done those. Um, but, but whenever we travel or we're going somewhere, uh, yesterday, I ventured out to North Hills. That's a more scary area to me, by the way. North Hills and Raleigh, have you been there lately? That place has exploded. And trying to find my way around there, I'm like, okay, I, I want to know exactly where to go. I want to know the exact address so that when I park, I know where I'm going. You like that? Does, do any of you ever map out the night before just so you know the time and kind of get a general idea of where you're going? I like to do that because we like to have information. And, and Paul says, you know, God has given us information. Verse 30, if you go on down in that same text, and, and there's a port, an important reason for this. Now, remember, he's talking to a group of people who some are idolatrous, some are atheistic. And he's trying to reveal to them the God that, that, that they did not know. And he gets down to verse 30, and he says, These times of ignorance, ignorance of what? Ignorance of God. God overlooked. But, but, 
Now he commands all people, that encompasses everybody, to do what? To repent, to change the way they're living, to change the focus of their life, and then to turn toward God. Why? Because, verse 31, he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. There is this urgency for us to seek after God because what we know is is God is coming to judge us. One day, every individual who has ever lived or will ever live will stand before God in judgment. As Paul delivers this message, and you get down to verse 32, the text tells us that some, when they heard of the resurrection of the death of the dead, mocked. And many do mock at God. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, Jesus says to us, There are a lot of people who are going to choose the easy way in life, what they think is easy, over the more narrow, difficult way to God. So many mocked, however, but others said, we will hear you again about this. Later in the text, it says that some of them became disciples. In our series here, we've been discussing this idea of our search for God, our search for meaning and direction. In in our first study, we, we looked directly at the search for God. In our last study, we looked at where should we seek after God. Today, I want to go to, to the idea of what are the implications of the existence of God. We're, we're going to, um, in that, we're going to agree on some things. Number one, God exists. I'm not going to deal with the existence of God in this particular study. If you have an interest in that and, and you're not sure, talk to me afterwards. We'll, we'll sit down and we'll talk about the existence of God and why we know God is real. We're also going to... Um, we're going to take uh, for granted today that, that God has, has revealed his will to us and that we can know what God wants from us. Again, if you have um, an interest in that, if you're confused about how God has spoken to us, let's talk afterwards and let's, let's look at the information about that. But today, I really want to get into this concept of if I say God exists and God has God does exist, and, and if I say God has revealed his will to me, what are the implications of that? A couple of things here that, that, that I think are implied just by the very nature that God is real. Number one, God has made himself known and knowable, and I want to explain what I mean by this. So let's go to Romans chapter 1. I appreciate Van reading that text to us, but I want to go back there for just a moment. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. Now Romans, Paul is writing this letter, and and I'll tell you at the forefront, Romans is one of those uh, books where Paul really digs into some doctrinal things and in regards to faith and grace and work. And how those things interplay with one another. But as he begins his text, if you go to verse 16, he tells us that that he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Right? He, he, He lays down his theme verse in verse 16. And 17. That's the theme of the book of Romans is the gospel of Jesus Christ and its power to change our lives, its power to give us hope, its power to bring us forgiveness. 
And so as you get into verse 18, he gets into the meat of what he's going to talk about. Now, I mentioned this in the past, but just real briefly, if you want to summarize the first three chapters of Romans, Romans chapter 1 is the Gentiles are sinners. Romans chapter 2, hey, you Jews, you're sinners as well. In Romans 3, you know what? We're all sinners. We've all sinned in our lives. Now, that's going to play real important in the rest of the book. So he really drives that home. And I'll come back to that theme in a minute. But I want you to note 18. Now, if you look at at the history of our world, we, we were talking about this downstairs a few minutes ago, just briefly. But when we think about God making himself known, when we talk about the law of God, there are three important eras of time that, that are important for us to understand. Number one is that in, in the beginning, God spoke through the patriarchs, like Adam, like Cain, like Abraham. God spoke to the families through the patriarchs, and he delivered to them his law. And so the first period of time, for about the first 2,000 years is the patriarchal period. Then with the coming of Moses, when God chose the Israelites out of all the people on earth to be his people, he delivered to them the Mosaic law. But now there's something that maybe we don't think about very often is, okay, I know about the Mosaic law, and that was given to the Jews, but what about everybody else? What about all the Gentiles? There were vast numbers of Gentiles in our world. What kind of law were they? Were they not under law? Did they not have any regulation, any command from God? No. They had law. They were still under the patriarchal law. Those things were still binding for them. That's important when we get to Romans 1.18. You need to understand that. That the Gentiles were not without law. They just had a different law than the law of Moses. And you'll see why, hopefully, why that's important to know. Go to verse 18, Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed. Notice that term revealed, like, like opening the curtain. Is revealed from heaven. In other words, God is revealing this against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You notice how what he's saying is he's not just looking at the Jews in regard to unrighteousness or unholiness or ungodliness. He's looking at all men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Just because I'm not a Jew does not excuse me from God's judgment. Verse 21, for although they knew God... What did they do? They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Why? Verse 23. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. He says, Gentiles, you're condemned because you gave up, you exchanged God and knowing God for your created things. You've tried to replace God by your own creation so that you are without excuse. Paul says, God has made himself knowable. It's not as though you don't have the information. God has made himself known. In Jeremiah, the fifth chapter, 
and verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 21. Here the prophet says to the Jewish people, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes. It's not for lack of ability, but do not, but see not. Who have ears, uh, but do not, but um, hear not. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? You know, James tells us that even the demons believe and tremble before God. How arrogant of mankind to stand up in his, um, in, in, in his overconfident way and say there is no God. Jeremiah says, foolish man, do you, do you have eyes and don't see? Do you have ears and you cannot hear? They have eyes. They have ears. But they have chosen not to see. Verse 24, verse 23. This people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God who gives us rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps us for, for the weeks appointed for the harvest, your iniquity, your sin, have turned these away, and your sin have kept good from you. When we refuse to believe God, the prophet says we refuse the blessing of God. But we can't blame God for not knowing him. God's revealed himself to us. He's made himself known in all kinds of different ways through his creation, through his word, through his prophets. Stubbornness has led man astray. Stubbornness to do his own will and to refuse the will of God. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter 10. Uh, interesting situation going on in Luke 10, 38. Jesus has come to the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, some dear friends of his. And, and he's traveling through the area, and, and he decides to, he wants to go in and be with his friends. He comes into the home in Luke 10, 38. Martha welcomes him, and and then as he comes in, she begins to become really busy. She's running around. She's trying to make sure he has food. And she's taking care of everything. She's very busy. Mary, on the other hand, is not doing that. She, the text tells us in um, verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. So you got a really stark contrast of two people. You've got Martha and all her activity, and you've got Mary and her attention, her attentiveness to Christ. Now, this is going to cause a conflict, isn't it? The text tells us that Martha gets real upset. Martha's very busy, very busy. And she says, she looks across at Mary, and she says, Verse 41, or sorry, verse 40. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Now, we might expect, and if you have children, this comes up. We might expect Jesus to say, hey, Mary, get up. Don't you see your sister? She's doing all this work. That's not what he says, though, is it? It's interesting how he challenges this. Martha, oh, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things. A lot of anxious, troubled people, isn't there? Maybe many of us. A lot of busy people. Busy, busy, busy. 
You're troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. What had she chosen? You got activity versus contemplation. Some of us are seeking to do a lot. And sometimes we don't even know what we're aiming for, but just as long as we're busy. Some of us have trouble sitting down. Do you ever have trouble doing that? Just sitting still. Go to the mountains. People don't have as much trouble with that there. Martha's chosen that good thing. It's, I mean, Mary's chosen that good thing. It's not going to be taken away from her. God expects us to contemplate. I like the way it's, it's termed in the life of of Josiah, King Josiah, young man, eight years old, he's chosen to be king. Wow, what an honor. Well, it's an honor until you consider what kind of environment he's being chosen to be king in. Manasseh, his grandfather, corrupt, evil king, did lots of evil things. Ammon, his father, just as corrupt, just as evil. They have taken the children of Israel away from God. They have made the land devoid of interest in God. That's the kind of rule he comes into in First Chronicle or Second Chronicles 34. Eight years old, this young man's given the responsibility of reviving the Judah, um, Judean people. Text tells us that he was chosen at eight, yet it was in his eighth year, verse three, that he began to do what? While yet, while he was still a boy, he began to seek God. You know, before David could, I mean, before Josiah could do all the good things he was going to do, what was the principle which underlined that? is that he began to seek God. You know, there are a lot of people in our world who, who, who profess to seek God. And when you look around, and you look around in our community, when you look around in the world, there are a lot of different people who claim to be Christians, who a lot of them seem very busy. Why all the confusion? And I believe this is the principle. A lot of us feel as though busy means productive. But a reality that you'll find in business and in life in general, being busy is not necessarily the best thing. If we're active, yet we're, we're aimlessly looking around, aimlessly working around, without any direction, without any contemplation of why we're doing this. We're in danger of getting ourselves into things we should not be involved in. Recently, uh, listening to some debates with, with, with brothers in Christ and, and some people who, who are struggling in denominationalism, and one of the things that... that that I keep going back to in my mind is, is the evasiveness from those who are busy in understanding why they're doing what they're doing. Many of us feel like, man, I'm a good person. Look at all that I've done in my life. Without ever considering, is this really what God wants you to do? Is this who God wants you to be? Josiah was praised because his activity began with a search for God. 
you'll also notice that began in the eighth year. It was in the twelfth year that he began to act. He spent four years seeking God. And then, in his search for God, he found him and began to be directed at what he was to do. It was only after finding the word of God and understanding what it said that he truly became a man after God. God has made himself known and knowable The first question is, will we take the time to know God, to know what he says, to lay aside what we believe, and to seek after what God really wants us to be? That's important, and that to me is the first step in finding God. Number two, when we think about the implications of the existence of God, it's not just that he's, know, that he's made himself known and knowable. It's that because God exists, sin cannot be excused or reasoned away. Time and time again, I, I see people trying to reason away sin. I, I was listening to a news report this morning where now there's a, there's a huge push by some in politics and in other facets of government and in and, and, and active groups to uh, legalize and desensitize prostitution. Now, I know growing up in a small town that there were certain things you just knew, and, and one of those was prostitution is wrong. Yet, you don't have to look very long in our culture to see how so many of the things we took for granted just a decade ago, we can't take that for granted any longer. We can't take for granted that the people we meet on the street understand morality based upon the Word of God. So much in our life So much about sin has been reasoned away, has been excused away. Now, that's both in in a bigger, larger sense of, uh, of culture, but even personally. You know, it's one thing for me to spot it in our culture, in the lives of other people. It's another thing in my own life. Do I ever catch myself trying to reason away my sin? To excuse it in some way. You know, back in the book of Romans, <clears throat> chapter 3, what does chapter 3 and verse 10 say? As it is written, Paul's going to quote from the Old Testament, and he says, as it, was, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There's no one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There's none who does good. No, not one. Later on, he'll, he'll really put a punctuation in verse 23, doesn't he? Verse we've heard quoted quite a bit. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is something that, as human beings, we have been far too often acquainted with. We're all sinners. We all know that intellectually, I think. Most of us would agree with that. If you disagree, let's talk afterwards. But it's another thing to see ourselves that way. I think most people if you were to meet them on the street, would say, are you, if you ask them the question, are you a good person or a bad person? Most of us would say, I feel like I'm a pretty good person. In that statement, what we're really saying, and I know we don't mean to say this, but it's the truth, is we're excusing away sin in our life. We're trying to equate one sin against another. We do it all the time, big sin, little sin. Well, he's a murderer, so I know he's bad. I'm not that, so I must be better. I'm a good person. 
And I think that's why many people, if you were to survey them in our own community, would say, yeah, almost everybody's going to heaven. Why is that the case? It's because we, in justifying someone else going to heaven, are in essence justifying ourselves. If we were to take a real look in the mirror of who we are, outside of Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I deserve to go to hell. It's not God who has to condemn me. What does John 3.17 say? He did not send his son in the world to condemn the world. We've already done that to ourselves. It's not even God who condemns us. It's we ourselves. But we often try to excuse our sin, to push it aside, to reason it away. But there's something I want you to know. We can do that while we have time, but there's a time when... Life ends. Genesis 3.19. After Adam and Eve sinned, what, was the, um, what, what did God say to them? He says, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until when you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. What's he saying? Adam, Eve. Because you've sinned, death is an appointment you will meet. Ecclesiastes 12, 7, Solomon says it this way. He says, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Hebrews 9, 27, what does the Hebrew writer say? And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that, judgment comes. All of us have a time period in which we're living, and when that time ends, there's a cold reality. I'm not trying to scare you, but it should scare you. It should terrify you if you're outside of Jesus. You will die. And you will face God in judgment. Matthew chapter 16. What does what Jesus say in Matthew 16, 26? Matthew uh, 16, 26. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? In all of your pursuits for happiness. If you achieve every sense of happiness that you could, what's the end of all of that? You're happy for a moment, and then death comes, and judgment is faced. What has all of that gained you? Jesus says nothing. What shall a man give in return for his soul or in exchange for his soul? What are you giving up for your eternity? Verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. That's what Jesus said. Do you know the term hell, not Hades, but the term hell in the Greek, which, um, what is it leaving me right now? <laughs> anyway, the, the Greek term for hell in the New Testament is used 11 times. You know that all but one of those is used by Jesus? All but one time. That will come to me right at the end, and I'll be standing back there regretting that I couldn't remember that when I needed to. Gomorrah. Is that it? Yeah. Gamora. Gehenna. Thank you, Roger. I knew somebody would help me out. Gehenna. That's the Greek term for hell. Not Hades, which is translated in Matthew 16. Jesus says, 
what profit is it going to be to you if you gain all the world's goods and find yourself before him in judgment, unforgiven? Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, what, what does Paul write? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. What drove Paul in his ministry? He said it is the desire to communicate the message that death and judgment are coming and are appointed for all. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in, in talking about the second coming of Christ, what does Jesus say in verse 8? 2 Thessalonians 1 8, when Jesus comes in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who have not obeyed or do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. It is a fearful thing, Hebrews 10 and verse 30 and 31. It is a fearful thing to stand before the living God. Jeremiah, what did he say? Why do you not tremble in fear? It should cause us to tremble in fear. Sin cannot be excused or reasoned away. The only way you and I can stand before God and escape judgment is through Jesus Christ. Back in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 28, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. My only escape, John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Those are the words of Jesus. Acts 4 and verse 12, the apostle Peter said, Acts 4 and verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As we close out, I want to go to Acts 8. Jesus is our only way of escape. And I want to show you something. In Acts 8, we have Philip the evangelist. Verse 29, the Spirit tells Philip to go, and I want you to catch up with this chariot, and I want you to go and talk to this man. Now, we don't know the man's name. We just know him as an Ethiopian eunuch. He's in the high court of, we think, Candace in, in Ethiopia. And that man is sitting there reading from Isaiah 53. As he's reading it, and as Philip asks him what, what he's reading, he reads the passage, and in verse um, 34, the man says to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Notice verse 35. Philip opened his mouth, beginning at this scripture, what did he do? He taught him about Jesus. He taught him the message of the cross. He taught him the gospel message. If you go on in that reading, you go down to verse 36 and 37. Verse 36, as he's taught him about Christ, and he shared with him the gospel, which 1 Corinthians 15 tells us is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. This man sees water. Verse 36 says, as they were going down along the road, he came to some water, or they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Verse 37, Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. The eunuch replied, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. 
Why did Philip say, if you believe, you may? Mark 16 and verse 15 and 16 records for us the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15, Jesus says to the disciples, go and do what? Proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Notice verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. My only way of escape is through Christ. My only way into Jesus is through immersion into his death burial and resurrection that text ends with the eunuch running away rejoicing or leaving that area rejoicing excited why because he knew in that moment he was in Christ he was saved he was now a member of the Lord's body the only way of escape for us or anyone is through Jesus Christ Galatians 3 and verse 27 tell us what For as many of you are baptized into Christ, have been what? Baptized into his death. We have been clothed in Christ. Galatians 3.27. It's in baptism, in immersion, that you and I unite ourselves with Jesus. This morning, have you had your sins washed away? Have they been cleansed by the blood of Jesus? If not, I have to implore you, don't leave here. Don't leave here in that condition. You have set your path on a dangerous journey. So long as you live outside of Jesus, you live outside of his forgiveness. The only way into his forgiveness is through his blood. That can only be contacted through obedience to the gospel. It's not faith alone, which so many teach. Believing in Jesus is not enough. James tells us the demons believe. They even tremble. They do better than many of us as human beings. Yet are they saved? The only time faith alone is ever used is in a condemning way. James says, will faith alone save you? No. It's not enough. It's when our faith, our belief, combined with our action in obeying the gospel that our sins can be washed away. This morning, can we help you? Are you ready to have your sins washed away? Can we study with you? If you'd like to know more about this, please reach out. If you're a member of the the family of God and you've wandered away, we call you home as well. Do you have a need, any need whatsoever? Please come together. We stand and as we sing. He is able more than able.
so thankful for the opportunity to worship you here today, Father. And Father, we're so thankful for the message here today. And Father, we, Father, we pray that each one of us take the heart and uh, go out and have to spread your word and be alive to this community. Father, we, uh, Father, we pray for the sick of our congregation, Father. And If you have a commission committee, could I meet back here?